Hi there, everybody. Welcome back to another episode here on the channel. Now, today I am joined with Karen Virtue, who is a trans woman and ex-Christian pastor. I wanted to be able to clarify in the beginning of this video, which I don't always do with discussions like these, that the interviewee is pretty sensitive about this subject matter because it's personal, and I wanted to respect them in their appeal to everybody on this channel. So hopefully you'll be mindful that there is the dead self that they don't identify with anymore, who is Paul. And now that as a trans woman, they go by Karen. So it is she and hers. That's her gender orientation. Now, for me, I'm a bit more conservative or more of a biologically based gender sex economy. Uh, that there's a tighter relationship than maybe some of the trans activist types might assume. And so my opinions may not reflect or mirror that of Karin's, but I definitely wanted to be open-minded to what Karin has gone through, how do they experience their gender dysphoria, and how do they view their sex in relationship to their gender. Hopefully you'll be mindful of that as well, and as we talk about their gender dysphoria and their transitioning at various points of the interview, just keep in mind that they view their real genuine selves as feminine. So it's something intrinsic, and the world medical professionals who helped give birth to Karen didn't know otherwise. That's their view of how they came to be in the world, and they had to come out as trans. So hopefully that clarifies a little bit about how Karen experiences the world, and how hopefully you'll be able to relate to her as much as you can. This is definitely a conversation that had me thinking a lot about how we interact with our trans friends, and I hope that it will allow you to be able to embrace and hopefully understand those who identify as trans, who have gender dysphoria, or are choosing to transition for any number of reasons. I'm no expert, I'm not a medical professional, neither is Karin, but this is just two friends talking about the various life aspects of faith, their sexual orientation, and gender expression. I hope you enjoy. All right. Well, why don't we get started here? Yeah. Okay. All right. Great. Hello, everybody. Good to see you all. Well, at least you're seeing us. I hope you're doing all fantastically. I have an amazing guest with us today with an incredible story. Their name is Karen, Karen Virtue. Is that correct? Yes, that's correct. And her pronouns are she, her, hers. Now, Karen, would you mind sharing a little bit about yourself? Sure. Um, I'm... Uh... I hit the 55 mark last year um, and got my AARP card. Um, I've been married to my wife, Sherry, for 35 years, and we have six kids and one grandchild turning six this week. Wow. Congrats. <laughs> yes. It's a big milestone and love grandkids. Um, I'm a disabled veteran of the U.S. Army. Um, and I spend a lot of time since I'm a disabled veteran, um, I have some free time. Mm. So I spend a lot of time volunteering with boards and agencies that work on healthcare, especially for underrepresented populations. Mm. And by underrepresented populations, do you mean trans folks and queer individuals? Um, yes, that, that's part of it, but I would say the intersectionality is even broader because it represents people of color, um, people living in poverty, um, people in rural communities versus urban areas. So that's where, where is this based off of? Where are you in right now? Oh, so I'm, I live on the central coast, coast of Oregon. And so a lot of a lot of the work is based on, yes, focused on community members in rural Oregon. Wow, <clears throat> I know that bigger cities definitely have more resources for those demographics. Yes. So you're definitely reaching out to those in need, especially yes. probably not as many of you as many minorities in general. Correct. Yeah. Yes. Now the incredible thing is, I know that we've gotten in touch through a pastor friend of ours and. You yourself grew up in the Christian faith. You were a pastor at some point as well. Is that correct? Yes. Wow. Um, <laughs> I, 
I was a Baptist minister okay. um, for 10 years. I wow. invested my life, and really that was, that's still more than half of my life was really devoted to Christianity. Mm. Um, and either toward, you know, as a teenager and young adult, preparing for ministry and studying, um, and then those years in ministry. Mm. That's incredible. So you're telling me that you grew up in the Christian faith, and now today, not only were you a pastor, but now you've become a woman. Yes. That's, that's the real deal, guys. That's what we're hearing. And we want to know how this happened. I mean, how did you develop from a young boy who was going to church on a regular basis, it seemed, and in a pretty conservative background, now into a very diverse experience of becoming a woman, transitioning into Karen, and then also working on boards in healthcare advocacy for minorities. So let's begin with so if, love, and how did you how did you function within that Christianity? Yes. So if I could take you back just just a bit, John. Yeah. Um, so you talked about I grew up as a young boy. For the trans community, most of us who experience gender dysphoria, mm -hmm. and I guess we might need to talk about what that is, but um, mm -hmm. so we so we may have lived closeted even as a child and presented as a boy, mm -hmm. um, but it isn't that we became a woman. It was that being a woman was suppressed because of mm -hmm. the subculture that I grew up in. And so I wasn't allowed to be a girl. I wasn't allowed to express myself the way that I truly am. I see. And I think that's really important for most members of the trans community to kind of make that distinction. Yeah, yeah. I definitely have heard of experiences like that. And I think for most people that I've talked to who are trans, they seem to indicate, yeah, I was this and that. I, I either was a boy or a girl, etc. And then I became something else right so I, I never mean any disrespect with that so thank sure. you yeah so, yeah so that they can know i don't ever associate that experience as being my true self right and so right. They, your previous identity as paul as a boy was not your true self then is that what you're getting at yes yeah. and um and I'm okay in this conversation for using that as a jumping off point, right. but I do want to mention just so everybody knows, um, m most trans women and men, trans men, um, prefer not to ever use their past name. Um, that's right. referred to as a dead name. Mm -hmm. So that was a name that's associated with oppression, suppressing your true identity. Mm -hmm. And so, um, that's very difficult, I think, for people who, who aren't familiar um, because they, um, in our construct of how our society has been, mm -hmm. they, want, they want to be able to refer to previously to coming out and transitioning as a different person. Right. And for me, um, you know, it was, this is always who I've been, but I wasn't able to express it. Gotcha. Right. It's so, very, very interesting philosophical and metaphysical conversation right. you have because true identity, you know, like if you go into your basic psychology or philosophy 101 class, you talk about that, like what does it mean to be you? And to have that development over the course of 50 some odd years, that either changes in some ways massively, massively as we will hear, but it's still you. What does that mean? So I think that's a very that's, good question. Yes. Yeah. So if you don't mind then, could you explain a little bit about how you grew up? You were growing up in Illinois, is that correct? Yes. So um, most of my young life was in the Midwest. I was born in Illinois. Um, when I was three weeks old, my father packed up the family to start at Bible college. He had been a farming auto mechanic and felt that God had called him to be a Baptist minister. And packed up our family. We moved to Missouri um, and lived there for a few years. And then Iowa, Minnesota, Wisconsin. Um, and so, yeah, the Midwest was my growing first 15 years of my life was all centered around the Midwest. Incredible. You know, I, I don't know if you know, but I'm here in Illinois right now. 
My yes. dad was born in Illinois too. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> That's pretty flat. Really, I grew up in Michigan, so I'm used to it. So <laughs> I've been enjoying my time here in Chicago. Have you been to Chicago before? I have been. Um, I actually, so I was born in Freeport um, and um, then actually ended up going back to finish high school in Rockford. Um, okay. These are all cities I don't know. I don't know if anybody is from. So the north, northwest, the northwest corner of Illinois. and. And actually, that's where my my heritage is from. I think my great great grandparents immigrated to Northwest Illinois and started the farmstead there wow. way back in the mid eighteen hundreds. So, oh, gosh. Yeah. yeah. Well, you know your history about your own lineage. That's pretty cool. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> um, yeah. And so as a, yeah, so as a kid, um, I was I was kind of quiet and shy. Um, I loved to read. I loved helping my mom in the house with baking and cooking and doing those kinds of things. Um, I loved music. I was not very athletic. Um, in second grade, I got in trouble because I couldn't do a jumping jack. And the teacher thought, no, I couldn't. And the teacher thought I was making fun of her. And she wow. called me out in front of the class. Um, and so my parents worked with me for two months to achieve doing a jumping jack. Wow. My gosh. Yes. Oh, wow. Yeah. You um, hopefully achieve that. Yes. <laughs> wow. Awesome. There we go, Karin. <laughs> I right. was... Yeah. So with school, you did seem to present as someone who was maybe a little bit more Played back in sports, wasn't the most masculine or gung ho type of person growing up. I can definitely relate. You know, I came out of the closet actually to a few friends in high school, and you know, it just it didn't really seem like I was always the most masculine type of guy. I'm sure my peers would probably agree, or your prototypical type of masculine guy. Not saying that you know, one sexuality obviously elicits a response of what the gender is going to be like, but um, your behaviors that is. But typically, you know the stereotype about feminine. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. yeah. And in the early '70s, when I was, you know, exp experiencing elementary school, you know, we were doing the picking teams for every recess and gym, and I was always with the girls, getting picked last <laughs> um, for any team because I couldn't contribute. Right. Um, yeah. Yeah. Gotcha. Well, that must have been hard. I mean, were you bullied a lot? You know, I definitely got bullied a little bit, maybe for being a sissy. That's what they say a lot of times, you're a sis or a wuss. Yeah, a, a little bit. It wasn't too bad. Um, most of my schooling was in um, Christian school. Um, so it was a little bit more sheltered. Mm -hmm. But there was still some of that, a little bit of ridicule. Just the, the trauma of being picked last every time. Right. Um, of, that you sense that you're not desired. Right. Um, right. That dread that comes over you when you know it's like, okay, time for dodgeball or volleyball, you know. I don't yes. Know. Yeah. Yeah. That's, that's tough. Now, who did you associate with, you know, like in your family or even amongst your peers? Like, who really stood out to you as someone who was supportive, who you looked up to? Or did you feel a sense of community with? Um, so because we did move, I think, every three years or less. I think I counted up when I was 18. I had lived in 20 different houses. Um, 20 different. So it was frequent moving. Um, and some of that was like when my dad was doing his seminary work. Um during the summers he would go take a small church and be their pastor for over the summer. And so we would move out of Minneapolis into rural Minnesota and then back again in the fall. Mm -hmm. um, but so we got really close. My, my sister is two years younger than I am. Um, during that time frame, my brothers are seven and nine years younger than I am. So they were very small, but there was still sense of, being the protective oldest sibling, 
and watching out for everybody and keeping everybody in line. Um, and w during those years, my dad was going to grad school full time, working full time, and then doing pastoral ministry on the weekends. And so it was me and my sister and my mom really were mm. this unit that <laughs> right. the, this family unit for for several years. Um, that was wow. that was life. Yeah. Now, how would you explain your Christian tradition growing up? Was it positive? What areas were good? I'm sure that you expressed in the past certain reasons why you have dropped the Christian faith entirely. But growing up, what was your experience like? Um. So it was it was kind of a mix. Um. I really thought my parents were devout um, Christians, that they were consistent with mm -hmm. what we heard at church, what we were taught, that my parents lived it out, so there wasn't a right. form of hypocrisy. Um, but um, honestly, on the other hand, um, they, were, they were taught their parenting after they started at the Bible college my parents attended. They were taught their parenting by, um, I think it was Bill Rice, maybe it was John Rice, a mm. famous old fundamentalist Baptist, who had a book on parenting called Love Em, Lick Em, and Learn Em. And um, on Amazon right now, if you look up the book, it's not available, thankfully. <laughs> but it, uh, the critique of it is it's the handbook on child abuse. Um, so, um, corporal punishment was the cornerstone of it. Yeah. Um, I was spanked for disobeying my parents. Mm -hmm. Um, I was spanked for wearing women's, uh, girls undergarments as, as a junior higher and later in high school. Um, I was spanked. I think one of the things that's most p painful for me is that I was spanked for having a bad attitude probably when I was about 11 or 12 years old and was still being spanked, that was the most consistent thing. What does that mean, um, that attitude? So if I wasn't happy enough? Oh, that's like half um, of teenagers. Yes, it's wow. kind of that whole emo vibe that junior hires and teenagers start to experience of right. finding themselves. And right. Right. It, it literally was an attempt to spank it out of you. And they actually used kind of the parallel of breaking the spirit of the child. That's actually in the books mm. um, that you try to break wow. their spirit because the spirit of a child or a teenager was right. considered to be satanic or evil. And so I heard of that in my Sunday school, but then I yes. guess so, okay. But they did focus even on the Old Testament where it talked about stoning a rebellious son. Um, oh, sure, yeah. And that that wasn't acceptable anymore, but... Right, right. I think it's but, taken to a, another extreme in your mind. Yes, yes. And so I think as I evaluate it now, my, my parents were sincere. They felt an obligation to God to their religious community to be good parents. They were held up as model parents mm. who had model kids. Yeah. Um, and I think even specifically around the area of being transgender, being queer, I know the one time when my dad, before he spanked me, told me he was concerned that <clears throat> um, he didn't use the word queer. He, he said that I would grow up to be gay. Um, and he didn't want that for me. And Why there was, that? um, so that was around the time when I, when I was caught wearing girls underwear. And so there was just this concern that something was wrong with me. Yeah. And in, I think in their mind, it, they equaled it with a destination of eternal damnation. Mm. And they loved me so much they didn't want me to experience that. Right. And I think that really is the core of the religion that I grew up in and ended up even being a Baptist minister in that kind of sub subculture. It really was a cult-like atmosphere. Yeah. Um, what where, like a cult-like atmosphere? 
um, th there really is an expectation for everybody to conform. Mm -hmm. And there's pressure um, of being, um, you know, put out of the church, disfellowshipped. Um, if you don't conform, mm -hmm. um, it's all it's based on fear mm -hmm. um which i think is a lot of what happens in cult-like atmospheres where there's a fear of what you will lose if you abandon if you mm -hmm. um yeah so there's this idea that usually they manipulate you all your assets and not only financial but even property would go into not only their name or just under their care and this it plays people in your life essentially like if it was a single mother all the aunts and grandmothers maybe would be kicked out and you can't listen to them you can't hear from them you know like they're telling you lies and so forth so basically gaslighting you do you ever experience that is that type of type yes of there wasn't there wasn't the property control yeah um but there was definitely the gaslighting mm. the pressure um you know, yeah. the, the, and a lot of it really was in the name of loving God, of your eternal desti destination, of your well eternal well-being is wrapped up in this. And we're not ju just doing this for our benefit. We're doing it because we love you. Hmm. Can um, you explanation or specific time that took place? Like, how did that look? Um... So, for instance, when my father would spank me for having a bad attitude, he would say to me, uh, this hurts me more than it hurts you. I'm only doing this because I love you, because I don't want you to end up burning in hell. Um, and that just became, the you know, the routine thing. And the church frequently, ha you know, they had things that there was just an expectation that you would you would conform. And so it really created for me specifically, as we think about, you know, coming out as a trans woman, it created an environment where that wasn't even an option for me. Um, women, women were less significant, less capable. Um, they accepted the Pauline teachings about women keeping silent in the church and not having positions of leadership. Mm -hmm. And so then there was also this kind of expectation that how would I reject the gift that God gave me of being a man? Mm -hmm. And how could I possibly set that aside to be a woman, to be queer? Yeah. Um, right. And even from women in the circle, they would say the same thing. Like, you know, you have this awesome possibility and responsibility to, to yeah. accept. I see. So there is that duality of, well, I feel I am led, you know, by God or even just my social circumstances to assume the privileges that, of being a man in this religious community, but then also your own personal struggle of identifying with your own gender, identifying with your own, you know, family and community that has always known you as Paul at that point. Yes. Wow. Yeah. Huh. And it really started, I mean, my earliest memories at three or four years old of this backyard Bible club of being taught that um, um, everybody's a sinner. What is sin? Sin is when you disobey your mom. If you take a cookie when she said no cookie, yeah. if she told you to clean your room and you didn't clean your room, right. that's sin. And then they would go through the Romans road kind of in a simplified manner of mm. of ending up with basically if you take a cookie when your mom said no cookie god will have to punish you with eternal damnation in hell wow and so if you don't get saved that's where you're going and because yeah. that was taught so strongly at such a young age yeah. that is an easy fallback then for everything that happens as you're growing up and as a young adult is this constant um, threat hanging over you oh my God, of, huge fear. of eternal damnation. Right. There's like okay. no room for love. I mean, did you experience any form of love within your own faith growing up? Um, so, you know, my, my mom was 
very caring and nurturing. My dad um, played board games with us, hung out with us, yeah, yeah. Uh, played played make believe with us. Mm -hmm. um, I think if it hadn't been for the dynamics of that cult like yeah, religion yeah. about yeah. about family life, about the all consuming fear of hell and mm. the desperation for heaven. Right. Um, right. That we, th things could have been right. healthy. Yeah. There was healthy aspects that were there, yeah. which also then made it hard to be honest about. I mean, even now as I'm going through therapy about my childhood, yeah. it's really hard because I do have memories of being, held and nurtured and cared for by both of my parents. Mm -hmm. But then there was also this piece of every, every moment though, you're surrounded by this thought of damnation. And I think even, you know, my wife and I talked about this recently being six or seven years old and our church is back in the seventies having new year's Eve movie night at church um, the uh, watch night service on uh, the night before the new year starts and seeing a movie was a big thing, but we watched movies like um, thief in the night um, where there's a rapture and all the Christians go. And then all the unbelievers are left, including kids to fend for themselves. And then it ends with a guillotine scene of people who didn't take the mark of the beast loot being decapitated. And it, it was, we grew up without television in our home. So right. then seeing that kind of a movie as a young child, yeah. it was terrifying. Right. It's kind of like brainwashing almost in a way, you know? Yeah. And I really, that's kind of what I think about this independent fundamental Baptist. So, and I guess maybe I should have added that to clarify. This wasn't just any Baptist circle. It was this very small, very fundamentalist, Right. Um, circle. Right. And to finish my junior and senior year of high school, lived with friends of the family um, who were um, leaders in the church that was kind of the main church supporting my parents. Mm. And while I was there, um, they would beat me. Um, he would beat me. Mm. Um, he would cut a, an actual willow switch from a willow tree. Um, and he would make me drop my pants, my underwear, and he would swat me. I would end up with welts. Every every blow would cut through and would bleed, and I ended up with welts and bleeding on my buttocks, on my legs, even on my genitals wow. um, from being whipped. Um, and again, one of the incidents, at least, was related to my dysphoria and wearing women's undergarments and mm -hmm. that being unacceptable. Right. But other things were being 10 minutes home late for curfew. Um, and part of the conversation around the whipping too was how can you even consider yourself a Christian? Mm. Because um, of gender dysphoria? Yeah. Okay. Yes. And when, when did that gender dysphoria even begin for you? Um, I remember having moments of it as a child. So gender dysphoria is when you feel like you're not in the right body, that you should have been a girl or you should have been a boy. And you were assigned by the doctors when you were born who said, it's a boy. And they wrote that on your birth certificate and it was assigned to you. And, yeah. but you don't, you don't fit into it. Um, it really is, gender is different from sex and sexuality. Mm -hmm. um, for anybody who's interested, I would encourage you to Google the gen gender bred person, um, and you'll come up with an excellent um, illustration of how we kind of see the difference of gender and sexuality. And gender really is primarily what's in your head, how you feel and think about yourself. Mm, interesting. Um, and so for me, I wanted to play dolls. Um, and yeah. now with that, it, it seems to me, though, that there is a biological reality that informs our gender, right? So that there's relationships with gender and sexuality and sex to some at least average aggregate 
you at least. In, in, in our in our binary system, that culture ha that um, especially maybe mainstream of most cultures, that's true. But I would point out that there are cultures that don't have that binary. Um, right. The Native American culture has what they call two spirits. They've had that for Indians, right? Yeah. Yes, centuries, where they um, they view a third, kind of a third, which is usually somebody who other cultures would assign as male, but has um, male genitalia, but has a gender of female, and they're considered to be two spirits. Um, I'm not sure how to say the Samoan word because they also have a similar word that in English they call them aunties. Um, I think it's Fafanafe or something like that. Um, and that's a similar concept. And there are other cultures that, that had allowed that other expression, right. um, right. that isn't just connected to biology. Um, so our culture and in our Christianity, there's kind of been this rejection. Um, I, you mentioned being intersex, being, you know, there's male, masculine, feminine, or male, female, and intersex. Intersex is where somebody's born with the biological traits of both genders, either some or all of that. Ambiguous genitalia, typically. Right. Yeah. Um, and so what was interesting to me is we kind of brushed that off as that's not relevant to this discussion about there just being two genders. But being intersex is um, happens at a rate of 1.7%, which is about as common as being redheaded. Mm -hmm. I've heard of that. And yeah. there are some disagreements about the rate. You know, Lisa Littman, and Fusto is the one that actually came up with the 1.7%. One and there are certain types of syndromes like Kleinfelter's or Turner syndrome that people have argued over. Well, you know, are you born into that? It's a it's a different pathway. That's the argument. So, as we're talking about spectrums, you know, human development in various ways, psychological, physical, sexual, they take in different strides, right? They take different forms, and so medicalizing certain types of illnesses physical abnormalities like Turner syndrome or gender dysphoria definitely carries a lot of weight and it's individual too. So yeah, there's still, I think, right. ongoing conversation. I think that's right. And, yeah. And as you mentioned that, I, I think one of the syndromes you mentioned, um, there was a particular Island. I don't remember if it's in the Caribbean mm -hmm. where a whole bunch of young women at age 12 or 13 were developing male genitalia. Mm. Um, and I don't know that the research has yet determined why this was happening. Right. Um, and so, yeah, but there is still, it leaves room for us to say, is, is gender biological? Intersex people until recently, mm. um, most of U.S. history, at birth, anybody born with um, some combined genitalia usually had the male genitalia removed and were just assigned female at birth. Um, but it isn't that simple because there are also other markers that it isn't just um, the genitalia because there are other markers that are left behind even if you remove the male genitalia that an intersex person still um, has some other development things that happen that are that that could be more masculine than would be associated with a feminine person right yeah i remember reading in michael bailey's mm -hmm. book the man who would be queen about the ryans and the johnsons and these were two families with boys who grew up with gender dysphoria in two different ways so john money is someone who actually helped transition young children especially boys gender dysphoria has been known primarily as some some disorder that has affected primarily boys. Now we're seeing rapid onset gender dysphoria with girls, but for much of the gender dysphoria, gender identity disorder, right, as it was previously named in the DSM-4, these disorders were pr primarily in young boys. Now, 80 to 90% per percent of these actually have desisted. So people with gender dysphoria, when they pass puberty, usually line up with their sex, 80 to 90%. And it's a really hard thing now. 
ethically, you know, we're, we're still answering tons of questions about how treatment should work. But when we're talking about the identity of that individual, that leads us to certain actions, right? If we have an identity, there, there are certain types of maybe civil protections that we should put on the person. Like if you're a trans, right, we don't ever want to discriminate against someone. But then in terms of medical talk, we have to look at treatment as well. If we're going to medicalize trans people, right? And this is something that even the trans community is not in agreement with. Where do you feel like you stand on that? Where, where do you feel like, well, where should we have someone start to transition? Where did you start to transition yourself? For me, I started transitioning when I was 53. Mm -hmm. um, and so that's much later in life. And I know that a lot of the conversations resolve around, uh, revolve around, um, you know, maybe 13 year old kids or even younger six and seven year old kids who right. express. Um, and so for me, I'm really comfortable with, for instance, my grandchild um, wasn't informed of a gender. Um, and they weren't assigned one. Um, I guess the state assigned them one when they were born, yeah. but they, they, they were not aware of that. Um, and they were allowed to dress both ma super masculine and super feminine and anything in between. Mm -hmm. And when they were about five years old, they just said one day, I'm a boy. And that was the end of the discussion and they were a boy. Mm -hmm. um, and so for me, I kind of like that, especially with really young children right. um, of letting it work out. And it does seem that there is a sense in which um, what society would normally assign most frequently is where people would end up mm -hmm. um that they would i they would identify and not experience gender dysphoria but they would accept and align with uh the gender assigned to them by society mm -hmm. um yes. i i'm still really uncomfortable speaking for the trans community as you know um I, I think we're seeing this more and more whenever a minority group speaks that a person says, I can only speak to my journey and my experience and I can't speak for what should happen for someone else right. and in their journey. And so it's really hard for me yeah. to explore what should happen if my, you know, if I have another grandchild that experiences gender dysphoria, yeah. what would I want for them to, I would want them to have be supported loved and accepted while they struggle through it, um, have some options available to them in their expression. Um, yeah. And other than that, I don't know what the answer should be. Do you ever feel like maybe the trans movement has moved too close to a precipice of danger in any way? Maybe, say, if you have babies, right, this term that they've recently created, say, your grandchild who was non-identified in terms of their gender would they ever feel confused you know because that's the argument at least if people say well they weren't given a gender orientation to kind of follow up you know to identify with their mother or th with their father and who knows maybe their father or mother isn't binary but when you have those social roles those so those gender roles gender is used as a very useful way of understanding who you're attracted to right so it has relations to sex in that way because we're able to orient ourselves and communicate what we probably like. So in terms of a male who is physiological. But, but, jo but John, in your own case, that doesn't work out, right? Because so you're... That's what I'm saying is right. I people who are attracted to other heterosexual people of the opposite sex, right? And not talking about myself, obviously, but... If I were to even talk about myself, my gender and sex align. So for the other individual who is struggling, like say your grandchild, who may have gender dysphoria or who may not, would you be able to provide an answer for them? You know, like, what should I do? You know, when I go to the bathroom, like which bathroom should I use? Or when I'm dressing up like this way, why are other kids making fun of me? And obviously we should always, you know, rule out. So, as a right. So I think that touches on a really important subject, uh, and, and so I'm going to give you an answer that isn't actually an answer to your question, but I think is really important. Okay. I find that 
almost everyone I know who's trans, whether they're 13 or 70, including myself, have very, very little interest in other people's toileting habits around us. Right. We just want to be able to use the toilet. What I do find is it's very creepy to me how much obsessed cisgendered white men are about toileting. Um, and I think there's... About cisgendered white men, or do you feel like it's more than that? Oh, what? no, I, 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 I said specifically what I meant, yes. Cisgendered okay. white men, and maybe I should add one clarifier, Christian, evangelical Christian cisgendered white men. Okay. I think they have an obsession with toileting. I think part of it does come from kind of a, an, a repressive approach to sex, much of which is based on kind of um, the separation of the sacred and the mundane. And they have a difficulty reconciling sex, even with their wife, in a heterosexual monogamous relationship between two Christians, reconciling the passion of that and intimacy of that relationship mm -hmm. with their, the rest of their Christian experience. Mm -hmm. And so sexuality becomes something that, I mean, if you see the significant number of people in men in Christian faith who are addicted to pornography, who have other sexual misbehaviors, mm -hmm. it seems to me that there's an issue that uh, about the bathroom thing that comes up frequently that trans people get asked to address this. And I think it's more an issue that could be resolved. You know, uh, there are more incidents of these kind of men being voyeurs, setting up cameras in women's bathrooms, sneaking into women's bathrooms and doing that kind of stuff. than there are trans people, tr trans people aren't interested in that. In fact, Trans women especially have a high rate of urinary tract infections and bladder infections because we have a fear of using the restroom anywhere um, because suddenly it, it isn't safe anywhere. And so actually, I, I very strongly support single-use restrooms. I love restrooms that ha restaurants that have single-use restrooms and government facilities that do single-use restrooms. I think in general, it's just a safer environment for everybody. Right, right. I think that's reasonable. I mean, trans individuals, they're not out to force anybody to conform, conform to their ideas of, okay, this is my gender, so I can assume any type of space that has this gender, right? For women, I can use the women's locker room or their bathrooms as well. And that, that obviously draws on so, some people's fear as well. What happened if I have a young girl and then there is someone who is a psychopath, you know, not trans people, but for those who are deranged and want to hurt and abuse young girls or yes. boys even, right? So that's the question that some people have raised and there have been, you know, just besides trans people, right? Just people going to bathrooms when they're not supposed to. So that leverages certain criminalities within this type of talk. And I think you bring up really great talking points, you know, about how do we respect each other's boundaries, right? Because we're talking about minorities, majority of people are cisgendered. And, you know, when we're talking about cisgendered, people sometimes don't even feel comfortable being labeled that, you know, why am I a biological when I'm just a woman, you know? And then, well, we have to acknowledge those who are trans, those who are not biologically born a woman, right? But identify as women. So what would you say then qualifies you as a woman? Um, so that's, that's really difficult to share. And, uh, and part of that is even um, in therapy a couple years ago, I had a therapist who um, was recommended to me for part of dealing with gender dysphoria. Mm. And when I started to answer that question, um, they rejected all of my answers. Um, I don't know how I can explain how, um, how my brain is, I, I'm a woman. Um, you feel like a woman. Is, yeah. it, is it the same thing as I don't feel like a man or I've always wanted boobs 
or a vagina or I just wanted to bake. I wanted to do my hair and put on makeup. So again, I think you're confusing things because um, right. how I know I'm a woman exactly. isn't exactly. isn't related to whether or not I have breast or a vagina. It's a gender thing. Right. Um, and right. some trans people actually br bring all of that into alignment. Um, but for me, being a woman wasn't, I mean, there was some of that. There was some body dysphoria. Most of it was mind and gender dysphoria that was related in the brain. There was also body dysphoria about not wanting to have male genitalia. Right. Um, but but the primary issue was um, I just, I, I, in my notes I shared with you before we started the podcast, I added something last minute. Um, when a, uh, I had surgery about five years ago and I lost a great deal of weight. And when that happened, was exactly was it really um, like you're transitioning? No, no, it wasn't. Um, and the reason I bring this up is I'd lived most of my adult life with low testosterone, um, and very low testosterone. Um, and I lost all of this weight after the surgery, and suddenly my testosterone skyrocketed, which I'd been warned about that there was a possibility that weight loss would cause my testosterone go up. And I hated myself. Mm -hmm. um, I couldn't stand the emotions I was feeling. Um, I was so desperate that I began overeating as a way to get my testosterone back down again. Wow, okay. Um, down again. Interesting. So for me, that's I, I think like that's the easiest story to share. Okay. about why I know I'm a woman, yeah. um, the comfort I felt since I started hormone replacement therapy, which in trans circles is just called HRT, um, the acronym for hormone, hormone replacement therapy, the comfort I have felt um, of completely switching the, the hormones um, and the at-homeness um, it, it's unbelievable. Um, yeah. Now, I think coupled with not only just your own personal experience of being what you felt like was women, you know, being a woman growing up, but also how other people identify you, that is, that is crucial, I would say, to your transitioning because, you know, that's why we talk about pronouns. How do you want to be identified? right? As Karen, as a woman, and how other pe people perceive you, though, that might not match up. Now, what kind of experiences have you had? Difficult, good experiences where people might have misgendered you? And I think that happens on a regular basis because typically we are living in a binary world, a predominantly yes. world. So yeah. Not that it's necessarily horrible, but for some people, it's not fun, you know, being non-binary and then you being binary in the sense that you're a trans woman but you have to identify in front of people. Now, how has that been? So, um, so, so I started out, um, I had loved painting my nails for years. Um, That's how you started out, then painting your nails? Yeah, probably more than a decade ago was when I first started painting my nails. Uh -huh. um, they didn't have these great extensions on them at that time. Uh -huh. um, but, <laughs> um, but then I started dressing kind of um, non-gendered. I would wear a pair of jeans with a blouse with that clearly wasn't masculine, um, right. with flowy sleeves and flowered and, you know, no mistaking it for like a flowered Hawaiian men's shirt. It was clearly somewhere in between. Right. Um, and I did that, and actually I first came out as non-binary for about six months. Interesting. Um, so I used they, them pronouns instead of he, him, or she, her. Mm -hmm. um, but then I realized just shortly into it that that was, that was a stepping stone, but that's not, that wasn't enough for me. Mm -hmm. It wasn't enough to leave, to not be a man. Right which is kind of where that non-binary left me. Like, so I can leave behind that baggage of 
all the testosterone and all of the need to be super masculine and everything. But for me, I was looking for even more than that, that I really, in my head, I knew that I was a woman. Um, and when I came out, um, I was on the city council of our small town in rural Oregon, and everyone affirmed me. Um, I sat next to people who are diehard Fox News GOP conservatives. Right, right. And they, were, they affirmed me, yeah. used my name, used my pronouns. Right. Um, engaged with me. Some of the questions, like, I don't know that we're going to get to them with our time frame, but like about athletics and stuff, we, we had lengthy conversations. <laughs> but I also had experiences where I've been intentionally misgendered. Um, I had um, in my last, I ran for mayor last year of our little town. Okay. And I experienced some hardcore trans hate. Um, you don't belong in our community, you will ruin our children, you're disgusting. Um, I'm Because I'm a disabled veteran, I get most of my health care at the VA hospital. Um, the staff there has been tremendously supportive, but I've had other veterans um, be really mean. Um, one of them was a Christian, came to me. Um, and um, started praying an imprecatory prayer over me as soon as they realized that my voice was not clearly to most people, my voice isn't femme enough. Yeah. And so as soon as they realized it, they, they prayed this imprecatory prayer over me. Right. And for those who don't know, imprecatory prayers are essentially cursings over people because God may deem as unwell, unclean, you know, this is something that people in the Bible did, you know, against their enemies, essentially. Yeah, so David, in the Psalms, there are several of the four or five, maybe, of the Psalms yeah. are prayers that David had that his enemies would be cursed yeah. and that they would suffer harm. Right, right. And that was that was my experience. So, um, yeah, uh, I, I have to say that, you know, um, you know, my wife and I have been married for 35 years, as we mentioned. Right. Um, that is a unique. That. Like, how, how did Sherry? Yes, yeah, so, that, so that's a good point, but let me, let me just jump back. One of the things that makes it very easy is that because she did choose um, to stay with me, it makes it very easy for me to be in society with another woman, going to the restroom, going to out to eat before COVID and stuff that I, that I'm in a situation where I'm not alone. And I know a lot of trans women when they're alone, they're much more vulnerable. Yeah. Um, in, in our little County, um, just before I came out, a young woman was, uh, um, assaulted, had her jaw fractured in three places and black eye, um, she literally went in and used the toilet and walked back out and just got beat. Wow. Um, so, um, yeah, so coming out, um, <laughs> which is an interesting, because it's a unique situation, about five years ago, I asked my wife, um, we had seen a documentary on trans people, and I think it was, well, no, it, was, it covered trans women and trans men, and I just asked her, so what would you say if I told you hypothetically that I wanted to transition? And she said, I don't think I could handle that. And I was seriously committed to our vows till death do us part. I love her immensely. Yeah. And it was a couple of years later. Um, I just let it sit and just lived life the way it was. Yeah. But a couple of years later, she came back to me and said, you know, Remember when <clears throat> you asked about transitioning, yeah. if you were serious and that's something you wanted to consider, I would support you a hundred percent. And I immediately took her up on the offer. Right. Um, and for me, I literally went New Year's Eve a couple years ago. I went and went to uh, the, an outlet mall. And bought femme clothes, and the next day just started wearing femme clothes all of the time. Gotcha. Feminine clothing, right? Yes. 
Um, there was a little more work to do having six kids. Mm -hmm. I had individual conversations with each of them. Mm -hmm. um, they have all been completely loving and accepting. I really was worried our youngest two um, are autistic, and I wasn't sure what their response would be, but they've all been fabulous. My three siblings also, very warm yeah. re reception. Yes. Um, my mother, I know that your mom's still. Yeah, so I came, I came out, that shopping experience was three weeks before my dad passed. He had terminal cancer. I think probably we could do a whole nother show exploring why I, why that made it possible for me to transition when I did. Um, so he didn't, he didn't know. Um, there's part of me that regrets that now. Um, but I also don't think there was any chance he would accept me. Um, I don't think his belief systems would have allowed him to accept me and accept himself at the same time. Mm -hmm. My mom has been, um, I know some trans people probably wouldn't accept my mom's response. She won't use my name. She doesn't call me my dead name, but she doesn't use my other name either. Um, she doesn't use my pronouns. Yeah. So she'll post about me on Facebook, no pictures, um, but she'll post my oldest child called and we had a great conversation. Yeah. Um, in person, she, um, you know, she's kind and loving. On the phone, we, we talk at least once a week. Mm -hmm. Very supportive. Okay. But still that, just that boundary. In the distance. Yeah, not going to touch that. Like, that's not part of my beliefs. Right. Yeah. Now, yeah. still with that fundamentalist mindset, Christian, conservative. Yeah, and I think, you know, she's in a situation where you know, her retirement check comes from a mission agency that's connected to that. Um, she's a widow. In her heart of hearts, like, she still professes her faith as a Christian. And yes, wow. very devout. Gotcha. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. That's, I think that's a very, very great thing that you can still have those warm, welcoming relationships with your family and friends, co co-workers even, right, with the board and the city council prior to when you actually or even fully transitioned socially. So that's a really remarkable thing. And I'm so sorry, you know, for the bad experiences that you did have. I mean, our society is still changing and warping and trying to figure out, you know, how do we associate, how do we welcome people who are queer, who are trans. And, you know, what I'm fascinated by, especially in my line of research, I'm not an expert, but I work in a lab that does do research on gender dysphoria. And it's just troubling, you know, trying to figure out well, this individual has this type of gender dysphoria, this person has algonophilia, and this person grew up never having gender dysphoria, but then as a girl in her teen years, she starts having these gender dysphoric feelings, and we're still trying to map, map out what these people's experiences are in relation to one another, but independent of one another, because you're an individual. And everyone who goes through these types of gender dysphoric feelings, they definitely have the right to be able to explore them and understand for themselves with their therapists what that looks like. What kind of advice would you give someone, especially as they're thinking about potentially transitioning or just having confusions? Are you someone who just affirms them completely regardless what their mental state would be, uh, whether they've been going through therapy to figure out if, if it's another issue? Would so, in another way. Yeah, and so I want to say the one thing about um, experiencing gender dysphoria. When I first started transitioning, I doubted my dysphoria. Mm. Maybe I'm just making it up. Maybe it's not real. Maybe it's not as intense as what other people experience. Maybe my dysphoria isn't valid. Mm. And what I found out is that's kind of common. And some of the things that I was able to talk with you about, I think that was one of the reasons I had to break down with my therapist a couple of years ago is because I couldn't speak honestly about the dysphoria I experienced as a child. I see. Um, there was still some trauma um, around my childhood and stuff that I just couldn't speak to it. Right. Um, right. And so I wonder sometimes if that might be th the case for a lot of people that they doubt the gender dysphoria or they don't think it's valid enough to meet some standard. Um, 
I do want to say that the rate of suicide among all queer children, LGBTQ, lesbian, gay, trans, bi, the suicide rate, the self-harm rate is extremely high compared to kids who are straight cisgender. And what we find is a loving, accepting parent makes all the difference in the world. And it doesn't matter what age we're talking about, whether it's eight years old or 13 years old or 55 years old. Um, An accepting family dynamic makes a significant amount of difference. Um, And this is true of somebody who, you know, you mentioned some of the cases where they experienced dysphoria and then ended up accepting the gender that they were assigned at birth. But having an accepting family to work through that with is is huge. And also, I think, destigmatizing any mental health therapy. Um, As a parent, if you're struggling with supporting your trans child, um, going to therapy yourself and getting help to wrestle through your own feelings and where those come from and how, how to be a loving parent to someone that falls out of what our society calls norm. Right. Very good. Okay. Yeah, I think that's definitely something we can agree on. I, I know that this is a very tricky matter because the science isn't out. You know, like the FDA hasn't approved cross-sex hormones and we're still trying to figure out who gets to have them, right? In the UK, they just ban anyone under 16, right, from having puberty blockers. So this is something that's ongoing. I'm so grateful that you're able to at least voice your personal experience on that. Now, have you done any medical interventions in terms of altering your hormones and even going to surgery one day? Do you consider that as a possibility? Um, so I, I am taking hormones. I do a hormone injection every week. Um, and it's been life saving for me as far as my mental health. Um, I guess as far as surgical interventions, this is what I want to say to anybody listening to this podcast. Yeah. I don't ask anybody, any man, are you circumcised? I don't ask him if he's taking Viagra. I don't ask questions about people's genitalia. And for me, that's where I want to leave this part of the conversation. And But I do think it's also a good moment to say, that should always be how you approach a trans person. That's right. That um, John and I have a relationship that I agreed to be on this podcast, so it's, it was okay for him to ask that question. But, but that is not a question you should ask a trans person in general. Um, there's so much information now with the internet that we have available for you to research and study what is transness, do more of your own work. Um, and so asking a trans person, are they pre-op or post-op or how many surgeries have they had or do they intend to have surgeries (laughs) yeah just imagine someone coming up to you it's like oh you're trans can i ask you what kind of surgeries you've had that would be be really awkward no yes i mean like i don't want to give out any of my information my medical history my surgeries that i've had like no that's a very personal thing so i appreciate you sharing on that yeah. And, and just, you know, to give another anecd- or illustration, maybe, for women, after you've given birth, you don't expect most people to be asking you if you had an episiotomy. Um, that's just not their business. Yeah. Um, so <laughs> I guess there yeah. are more shared experiences, like maybe men with Viagra, or things are more common, and so it's yes. a little stigmatized. But right. definitely being trans, you know, I think different people who are trans have different experiences. Some are more willing to share, some less willing to share. So keep that in mind, you know, as we're involved in our business. Yeah. And and some of it can be, a lot of this right now isn't necessarily the choice of the individual. Um, Our society for trans people has a significant number of gatekeepers. And for me, actually, that's more of a problem than it is a solution um, I think even some of the way you've addressed this, John, is more about the fear of somebody transitioning who shouldn't. And, my, and and I would say my fear is there are far too many people being excluded at the gate and not being allowed to transition. Um, and that's where we should address our attention is how many people are excluded, don't get the care that they need, 
aren't allowed to have surgery for some reason that the gatekeepers decide. And so, yeah. and that again leads to a lot of trauma for individuals who do feel societal pressure right. that the only way you can truly transition as a woman is if you've had breast augmentation and full bottom surgery, which is where they would yeah. um, turn the male genitalia into female genitalia. So, um, yeah, so it, it it's a traumatic area for trans people because society um, has so much pushback on that. But it's not an area that cisgender people experience a similar kind of response to care about their genitalia. Right, right. I think there's a lot of layers to that, too, because, you know, you have loved ones in your own home who I, I know who are trans, but also... You have people who are going through your own transition, you know, on a personal level, like Sherry. And so mothers, wives, husbands, parents, whoever it may be, who are part of that experience, because maybe they really do want to support you in whatever way, whatever decisions that you want to make at the end of the day. It's hard because we don't have the research, research out, you know, WPATH, which is the World Health Organization for Trans Individuals in Healthcare, and then also those like Lisa Lippman, Michael Bailey, and a host of others who study sexuality and gender dysphoria have not come out with, you know, the most conclusive research as of yet. There hasn't been long-term studies showing the effectiveness of transitioning medically. And even then, like in certain countries like Sweden and in the Netherlands, they've shown that suicidality and depression is still very, very high for those who have transitioned in the 70s and decades earlier. So it's a big majority, actually, not a small. So we, in my personal opinion, should just be cautious, you know, as we're talking about these things. Of course, we should affirm and accept those our friends who identify as trans, trans women, non-binary, etc. But if we're going to take medical paths, these are decisions that you can't go back on, right? And there was a recent documentary in, I believe it was in the Netherlands, they were talking about they're transitioning, their name was Patrick, and they used to be a boy, and then they transitioned to a woman, and they had regret over that. And you hear about these stories like Abigail Schreier, who talked to these teens who have transitioned, who have desisted, who have hysterectomies, and there's good experiences, and then there's also very traumatic experiences too. So we need to be able to hear all of them so that we get a good sense of the truth. You know, I brought up a question to you earlier at a certain point about cults because you viewed your past in the Christian experience, maybe not then when you were your dead self, Paul, but you had this experience now where you look back and you see that was kind of like a cult. I was being really only given one piece of information. And I asked you, do you ever feel like the trans community sometimes is like that? Because, you know, there's been some documentaries and some individuals, even in Lisa Littman's work, who's over at Brown University, who have expressed that, yeah, this trans group, very affirming. They told me how, how to get the cross-sex hormones, how to go under for surgery, and all the necessary steps to do that. And they told me to get away from my parents because they were telling me falsehoods and so forth. So if we're trapped in our own echo chambers, that's what I want us to avoid. You know, whether we're trans, religious, otherwise non-binary, you know, atheists, if we're stuck in our own bubbles, that's the most dangerous thing, I think. What do you think? Um, so I've, I, I haven't had an experience like that at all. So even though I live in Oregon, I'm hours away from Portland, which is probably one of the queer capitals of, <laughs> of the world. Right, um, right, right. But uh, I'm hours away. I haven't been to that kind of support. There's a small group of us um, that met before COVID here on the Oregon coast. Right. Um, but there was not pressure to, you know, to take any steps. Mm -hmm. Um, we had, um, a separate group that included junior high kids and teenier teenagers that was just about emotional support and didn't push any agenda for hormones or surgery, right. but just, ex you know, just pure accepting you for who you are and exploring with them. And several of them did, you know, vary between non-binary and femme and masculine. Um, 
I, I think it's, it is a difficult issue, but one of the things I would say that the way society, even in Scandinavia in the 70s um, and in the U.S., that there is still so much trauma attached to the process of coming out and the pain of that, um, that I don't know that the studies that are done about people who survive the emotional trauma can reflect well on was it transitioning because we don't transition in a vacuum we transition in a social world yeah and you know my in-laws called my wife and basically were implying she should divorce me and leave me mm. um and couldn't understand how she could tolerate and put up with me mm. um and so we don't transition in a vacuum and there is societal pressure and hate right. that has an emotional and emotion, mental and emotional toll on us. And so, you know, I, I don't know um, what the answer is. And I don't know how to study it um, because we can't isolate what happens. And so it's, it, it would, it would take, uh, it take a couple it, decades to get some real grounded work. Yes. Yeah. And, and to compare what happens when somebody's able to transition it in a complete, in a supported environment and see what their experience is a couple decades later and where they end up. Sure. Yeah, I think one of those arguments is, well, we kind of have that with Sweden and, you know, these other countries like the Netherlands because they're so gay friendly. Denmark, for example, they Denmark was actually one of the first countries, if not the first, to openly accept LGBT. LGBTQ individuals and gay couples, right? So if we do have that long-standing history of acceptance, and then that's the type of environment where we see people transitioning, do we see the same effect of high amounts of suicidality, depression, anxiety, and all those types of comorbidities? We need that. We need that. And so that's why I feel personally a bit more conservative on in terms of the transition train. Like, should we transition right away? We should take some necessary steps. You know, children usually get out of this, some people would say phase, but they would feel less gender dysphoric after puberty. So I, I don't think we should rush into things. That's my personal opinion. Yeah. Yeah. And, and again, I would say that, you know, somebody transitioning, even, even in the 21st century in the United States, mm -hmm. you know, I transitioned around the time where somebody was beat in public in my little county mm -hmm. and um you know every year there are more than a couple dozen um black trans women who are murdered yeah probably for being trans it, it appears that the way the murders happen um and so it's still it's hard to say that you're transitioning in a way that's supportive and free in a society Right. And, you know, I grew up, I grew up not, I spent a couple of years not far from the Danish border in, in northern Germany. And Hamburg is a very liberal, progressive city. Yeah. Um, and still, there was a lot of queer hate also. Yeah. And I think there, you know, that's one of the things that we have to balance is what is our society like? I have to say that for me, 2016 to 2020, was traumatic just because we had a, a political environment where um, hatred toward minorities was more tolerated. Mm -hmm. And that created emotional trauma for me just because it existed. Mm -hmm. um, so even though I didn't personally experience that, the fact that it was happening was emotionally wearing um yeah now can you speak to that effect we have conservatives on this podcast listening in and there are also more progressive liberal types as well my friends the greater network here on youtube and elsewhere could you speak to those who aren't questioning you know your decisions and wondering how did karen decide to be karen in this way and you know your life choices can you elaborate for those who are conservative religious christian and let them know like what what would you be more passionate to express you know your 
advice or your grievances? <clears throat> Yeah, um, so I think that's a great question. For me, I've left Christianity. Um, it's one of the things we talked about in the outline and didn't have time to get to. Um, I left Christianity, but I will say this. Um, the thing I have not abandoned is the teachings of Jesus. Mm. Um, the teachings of Jesus, I went from uh, you know a born-again believer who literally lived decades of my life committed to doing, living by faith, trusting God, trusting Jesus, making every decision that way. Um, and I became disillusioned by the fact that that's not what I saw in the church in America. Um, I've been in over five, 500 different churches, um, <clears throat> different denominations and brands and flavors and tried several of them for a lengthy amount of time. And I don't see, a, I don't see in the church a commitment to following Jesus. I see a commitment to the doctrine, the teachings of the church, but not to um, love your neighbor as yourself, self, right. um, not to care for the orphans and widows, not to don't cause a child to stumble out of the kingdom of heaven. Um, and so for me, I tell my mom when she worries about my soul, which she does, I know she prays for me, I tell my mom, I think I am a more devout disciple of Jesus than 99% of the Christians that I know. Um, and they're not all bad people, but they're not committed oh, to following Jesus. Out there are thinking like, okay, who are these Christians that she's hanging out with? <laughs> no, yeah. some of them are very good people, yeah. but they're busy making a living, um, taking advantage of capitalism. They're not selling all that they have and giving to the poor. Yeah. And following Jesus, right? Um, they are more concerned with what the American dream yeah. than the kingdom of God. Right. And for me, that's that's the thing that you know why I left. And what I would encourage Christians to do is: How did Jesus treat the woman taken in adultery? Mm -hmm. So your system may still call for LGBTQ people to be other than to be outside of, you know, your society of Christianity. But how did Jesus respond to the woman taken in adultery? How did Jesus respond to the woman at the well, to Mary Magdalene, um, to the disciples who cursed God, you know, um, Peter, during, dur during, uh, during Jesus' last day, um, and others, wow. yeah. Zacchaeus, um, you know, so how are you responding to those people? Because the people Jesus called sinners were religious leaders, the devoutly religious people. Right. Um, and they followed the law and knew, knew the Bible, you know, the they Old Testament. The laws even, you know, that was the problem. Right. Like pointed out. He was a kind of class in that way. Just called them out for their BS, essentially. Yeah, and I think that American Christians in the 21st century have their own form of following the law, attending church and giving money and voting Republican. <laughs> right. and, and I kind of... You know, vote across the spectrum, but yeah. yeah, right. yeah. I, I chuckle at that, but I think it truly now that seems to represent what's the expectation. And I'm not saying any of those things are... In, innately wrong, mm -hmm. but those are not the things that make you a follower of Jesus. Apparently not. Right. None of those things have, so you don't have to abandon going to church, reading your Bible, giving money, voting Republican. Right. Those you don't have to abandon unless they get in the way of you following Jesus. Yeah. And so what I guess I would ask is for people to commit to following the teachings of Jesus. Mm -hmm. For me, that's meant I set aside, and I know this would be very uncomfortable for most of your audience, I've set aside the rest of the Bible. And so for me, my focus is on the synoptic Gospels, Matthew, Mark, and Luke. Yeah. And what, if you have a red letter... Not even the fourth Gospel. No, no. Okay. Um, if you have a red letter edition Bible and you can read... And the words that are in red that are the ones attributed to Jesus, right. that is where I take my sustenance from. And that is how I try to formulate my life decisions, how I'm going to live, what I'm going to do. 
And in that, I have found room for me to be a trans woman mm -hmm. and pursue the abundant life that Jesus talked about. Right. Wonderful. Well, thank you so much for your honesty in that, because I, I don't think people hear enough of these types of stories, not only the transitioning in terms of gender, but in terms of our spirituality. You know, how do we become more human? Human in that we respect one another, understand each other's humanity. How do we become more human in that we understand that God, our creator, you know, at least we profess to believe in a God of some form. You, as an atheist, I, I don't know so much, but, you know, for those who do, no. how do we live a most moral and fulfilling life? And especially in the face of these issues like transitioning, gender dysphoria, and politics, our culture right now, you know, it makes for conversations like these ex extremely, extremely hard. So I really right. do want to do that. Yeah, and I, I do think that John would say that um, the fear of the trans community, the fear of the gay community, that <laughs> comes because you don't, because you're not experiencing love for them. Mm -hmm. Because love casts out all fear. Right. And so some of the messages about our agenda, I have no, I'm not part of a group that has any agenda for anybody else, sure. except people who experience gender dysphoria. <laughs> and I've never met a gay person who wanted to convert anybody else. Right. Um, they just want to be able to live their life. Hey, and so, yeah, yeah. And, and, and to have their humanity recognized. Yeah. And so, yeah. I think yeah. So for Christ, for the Christian audience, saying how how do I love somebody like that? Right. right. And what what would Jesus if Jesus were here today? How would Jesus te treat Karen? What mm -hmm. would he do with Karen? Mm -hmm. It's a very especially important question, and I think you are a manifestation of that question too in various ways. You know, how do we live that out? How do we show that? Yeah. yeah. Now, to flip that question, and I just wanted to say, I find that very funny because I love that verse that you just brought up, cast out all fear, love cast out all fear. I don't think that's in the synoptics, though. Is that right? No. No? Okay. But still, it, it's implied in the synoptics. We'll go I, I, I do like the Apostle Paul did in Acts where he uh -huh. quoted the, the uh, pagan poets oh. to, at, at Mars Hill sure. to convert them. He quoted their own poets right. in order to use it. and so. Yeah. That's what I would say is from you your it. from your own scriptures. <laughs> from your own scriptures, yeah, you can come to different conclusions. Yes, yes. Well, wonderful. What would you say then to those who are liberal, progressive, otherwise, who may be allies or maybe even uncomfortable? You know, feminists, those more divisive types. Let's say there's this term turf. You know, those who are trans exclusionary and these radical feminists of that sort maybe you might not agree with them, but those who you may agree with, there's disunity even within the LGBT community. As we read, as we hear on the telly and you know on YouTube, what would you say to the general broader community of the LGBTQ? How would you advise them to move moving forward? Well, that's a. I feel like I I'm. How do you feel answering that? Honestly. Right. Yeah. I feel like I'm so new to the LGBTQ community yeah. that it's hard for me to ask to inform them. Um, for me, for instance, as a trans woman who's attracted to women, yeah. um, you know, I, I, would I have to invest t time in issues re uh, uh, around gay men? No, but... Um, I'm passionate about um, the experience of gay men and have watched movies about the gay experience and what they've gone through. Mm -hmm. um, I think it would be a similar call instead of using first John to call people to cast out fear. Yeah. I would just implore people to be loving and kind. Yeah. Um, so even if you're on the liberal side and not accepting the canon of the scriptures, Right. That um, there's just a call for you as a hum uh, a, a humanist to to be humane, right. um, to see in me as a trans woman my humanity, my heart, my passion, mm. and accept me for who I am. Mm. Wonderful. 
I think we can learn a lot from that. And from your own experience, I know these trials, these challenges that you've had definitely teach us a lot about how we ought to look at trans individuals. You're not fully encompassing the trans experience, but you yourself definitely have a lot to offer for the viewers. So thank you so much again, Karin Virtue. It's been a pleasure. Yes. Thank you so Thanks, much. Thanks, John. This has been John Chen for John Chen Outs the World podcast. And I thank you so much again for joining us for today.